Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I've been a financial analyst and a research engineer and a financial journalist. I've filed several patents. And tonight's presentation is entitled, A Disinformed Citizenry, <clears throat> Media Censorship to Control Public Policy. We are not trusted to make up our own minds. We are told what to believe. Ghoulishly fascinating levels of disinformation. Regardless of whether you support or oppose the Libya intervention and its outcome, it is a very interesting study of how we get our information and how it shapes public perception. Most everyone who is not a monarchist, aristocrat, or totalitarian agrees that an educated and vigilant citizenry prevents corruption and bad policy generally. And Thomas Jefferson thought it was indispensable to having a republic or a democracy. Most agree that the media colors and shape stories to fit their own biases to some extent or another. Conservatives feel the media is too liberal, and progressives feel it is corporate in nature and pro-business. My own observation is that media outlets tend to criticize their country's rivals and often gloss over any defects in the power structures in their own societies. They are indeed part of the establishment, as Cenk Uyghur once said. In the U.S. and the West generally, less and less information is available about the activities of our governments. Secret classifications are now given hundreds or thousands times more frequently than in the 1960s when the Cold War was raging, where they were perhaps more justified. Routine information is now secret. Our founders and our most competent presidents would have been horrified at the lack of transparency in our government. So, let us examine the way that information went through the governments and presses in the case of Libya. For me, a network research engineer, it's an input-output model, a software decision tree. Garbage in, garbage out. <clears throat> now, why is this important? Because in any system or enterprise, we need quality control so that we can stop mistakes at the earliest point. If the basic underlying data is flawed, that flaw will carry on through the system, and in this case, to the public. In business, if the forecasts are defective, then R&D will either be too little or too great on product development. If the products are defective, the whole operation will be threatened and the customers will be damaged, and so forth and so on. In some cases, bankrupting the businesses or the customers. In communications, deploying an entire new service publicly that is uh, faulty can lead to the entire bankruptcy of the operation, as in the case of Sprint Broadband Wireless. So in the case of a major policy decision, like overthrowing a government, such as in Libya, how does information flow and finally become improved as people get a chance to examine it through debate and seeing what actually occurs? In other words, a feedback loop. In the case of Iraq and Vietnam, a great deal of information contrary to the government's position eventually changed the public view to oppose their governments, including the media. In the case of Afghanistan and Pakistan, the quality of information still seems poor. The public is uncertain whether to press on or to pull back, whether to shake hands or to strike. So a major event occurs. It is reported. The spotlight goes to the event. Leaders call in their advisors. The media sends out its investigators and pulls files from their research departments and convenes meetings of journalists and editors and promoters. At least these are the things that we hope should be happening. A framework is established. Boundaries are established. And this all relies on competent, accurate information. The information is poor quality, errors carry through the system. And in this case, the process of shaping perception is a top-down one from the government and the primary source media companies. <clears throat> As it filters down, the errors are magnified because instead of 10 people, it's now 100, it's 1,000, it's 10,000, it's a million, it's 100 million, it's a billion. In business, <clears throat> the process of making sure you have accurate information coming at the start <clears throat> is called due diligence. And the failure to conduct due diligence can lead to criminal fraud prosecution. This occurs when a company is valued incorruptly due to sloppy work and investors are wiped out or a few are enriched due to false information. So let us look at a case, for example, of Rwanda. 
of how the media and the government, how the media and the governments decide it is not in the West national interest to intervene. Due to lack of full information at the outset that would show that the human toll potential, the destabilization of the region, would actually harm the world economy and the political and commercial systems that the media serves. At the end, when millions are killed and armed gangs roam about the neighbor country, seizing mines, stopping production, wiping out entire species of animals and ecosystems, which are now of interest to the pharmaceutical companies, people shake their heads and rue their inaction. So where did the failures occur? This is the question. Was it in the researchers preparing the reports, overlooking the facts? Was it in those who summarize these reports to submit to decision makers? Was it the decision makers simply lacking competence to interpret the reports or through their prejudices ripping parts of the reports out? Was the error in the system such that the decision maker gave the reports to implementers and the implementers did not understand or uh, deleted parts of the reports as they promulgated them? Once the views were adopted by the governments and the key experts in the media, the primary source specialists in the area, in the example of Libya, for example, CNN and BBC, <clears throat> a subset of this data and these attitudes and these opinions are presented, a summary, a reader's digest, and it starts to percolate down to a second tier. Other departments of the government would make decisions based on this summarized view. Other media outlets would do their stories and their policies based on the primary source media companies. And uh, they will rely on the experts that they perceive in the problem domain, as it's called. The second tier, the regional papers, uh, the main news outlets without specialists in the area will reprint with minor tweaks what they consider in their interest to print, whether for a political agenda, for profit, or for the sincere desire to inform and call to action, or call, they make a call to simply bury it on the second page. Then a third tier engages, the pundit class, the talk shows. They would uh, take what they read and hear from both these primary and secondary sources and discuss them. Like the old game of telephone, where one person says something and you go around the room and finally it's uh, completely doesn't resemble what was originally said. Many will confuse the source and the destination, the tail of the head, thinking a pundit had new information, when in reality the pundit merely misunderstood or deliberately warped the information. And finally, the public hearing all this information starts to absorb it. The lower quality of the information, the more uh, inaccurate their perception of the world is. The better the quality, the more pressure they will put on their governments and institutions to act competently, or in their interests at least. In other words, with bad information, the public will demand bad policies. <clears throat> and then there's the final class, the academicians and the experts are interviewed in some policy areas, and they could add new important information to the feedback loop. But at other times, it could further degrade the information quality, such as interviewing people with undisclosed interests on the payroll of parties involved, such as the generals who are retired, who were interviewed in uh, the case of Iraq and didn't disclose their interests, that they were even paid by the Pentagon. Uh, or people covering their rear ends, whose own careers could be on the line if uh, the story is interpreted or certain information gets out that they might have failed to see themselves. So now we turn to Libya. At the time of the protests in Tunisia and Egypt, a set of protests also occurred in Libya. Although Libya had voluntarily given up its weapons of mass destruction, that is to say disarmed, and had allied uh, with the Washington during the Bush administration based on the promises of improved relations, the old attitudes about Gaddafi made it extremely difficult to not assume that this was a mass uprising because Libya was a society that few Westerners visited. There were three pieces of information that did not get to the public or were deliberately distorted in my view. John Stewart, the New York Times, and many others characterized Libya as a poverty sticking hellhole. On Wikipedia, someone actually altered the poverty stick statistic of Libya uh, that came from either the CIA or the United Nations from 7% and change to saying one third of all Libyans lived in poverty. In other words, from one third of our poverty rate to double our poverty rate when compared to the United States. This figure was then repeated five times later in the LA Times, verbatim, this doctored information from Wikipedia. In fact, the LA Times used secondary sources for all the articles that I saw. They essentially repeated what others had said in other articles. 
Uh, and of course, they probably use some primary sources periodically, but I would think they would have gotten a D or F in any college journalism class. So the information cor corruption was in describing Libya as a country that starved and robs its citizens, which whether true or not, was certainly not borne out by any credible statistical examination of sources like the United Nations Human Development Index and the CIA World Factbook. And here I want to make a brief quote to you from Sharif Ba. <clears throat> In an attempt to replace a dictatorial regime with a pro-democracy rebel government, the NATO invasion into Libya has destroyed their country's economic and social achievements over the last 40 years. Achievements that most countries under Western-style multi-party democracy and good governance can only dream of. Public health care in Libya, for example, was free, the best in Africa. Now, I want to add a caveat that when Libya liberalized in 2003 and started to sell off state assets and allow Western companies to acquire uh, state assets in Libya, uh, some corruption was introduced and certain medical procedures, so the same way people anecdotally speak of Canada, people had to, who had money would go out of the country to Tunisia to get where they had access to a more capitalistic system. Uh, the best in Africa, and that is certainly true in terms of distribution of the people. According to FAO's country profile in Libya, the country has had a higher standard of living and a robust per capita daily caloric intake of 3,144. Since 1980, child mortality rates have dropped from 70 per thousand live births to 19 in 2009. Life expectancy has risen from 61 to 74 years of age during the same span of years. Libya also has the highest uh, longevity in Africa. They have, the lo they have a one third the chance of dying on any given day than a, an American. They had three per thousand death rate and we had eight per thousand death rate. Um, and this was, a, I took as a primary source uh, from, I believe, the United Nations Human Development uh, Statistics. Um, I pulled a lot of my data from Nation Master, which is simply a compendium of statistics. Uh, and these sources tend to be very pro-West, very pro-IMF. So if they give Libya a good rating, um, they are essentially a uh, often an adversarial party, meaning that it's more likely to be true because they are more likely to be critical of Libya because Libya is a socialist country, or it was. Uh, on education, World Bank's country brief on Libya reports that in a relative short period of time, Libya achieved universal access for primary education, 98% gross enrollment for secondary and 46% for tertiary education. In the past decade, girls enrollment increased by 12% in all levels of education. In secondary and tertiary education, girls outnumbered boys by 10%. Prior to NATO's humanitarian intervention, Libya was at the implementation stage of an ambitious multi-billion dollar infrastructure development plan focused on the renovating and construction of airports, roads, housing, schools, hospitals, and water and sanitation projects nationwide, as well as the railway project, an ambitious 4,800 kilometer Trans-Africa railway plan to link Tunisia and Egypt and a southern network linking Sabah, the main city in southern Libya, to Chad and Niger. The railway project was as a talking point as a major infrastructural project of interest in the mold of the great man-made river where Libya irrigated a arid country from a ice age aquifer which has enough water to supply Libya with 400 years. <clears throat> so getting back to the story the second error which was made largely possible by the first error uh, was the assumption that most Libyans wanted the government overthrown, which based on scientific or scholarly research is not at all a given, and in fact can be evidentially deduced by their resistance for over six months against a military with 500 times the budget that they had, while also being attacked on the ground by us, uh, in, uh, insurrectionists. <clears throat> In addition, Libya's terrain is very difficult to hide in compared to Afghanistan or Vietnam. The third uh, uh, information distortion was to not examine the connection between Islamic extremism and the protests because they were the families of jihadists that were massacred in the prison uprising where 1,200 people were killed in approximately 1993 that were protesting in Benghazi. Benghazi is an area where lots of people were sent to fight in the jihad in Iraq and in Afghanistan. 